Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, everybody. Let's begin to just worship the Lord right where you are. If you're here in this sanctuary, if you're in your living room, in your kitchen, in your bedroom, come on, it says, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. The situation that we're going through may not be good, but God is good. His mercies never fail. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Great is his deliverance. Great is that salvation. Great is his healing. Come on, he's here. If the Bible says where two or three are gathered together, he's in the midst. So come on, get two or three around you right now. And God's presence is going to show up and show out in your life. Show up and show out in your situation. Show up and show out in your family. Show up and show out in your finances. How many of y'all believe that today? He's an amazing God. He's a faithful God. And there's nobody like him. I don't know about you, but I need him. Oh, I need him. And Father, right now, we come before your presence with, with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. Lord, we say this is the day that you've made. And we make a decision. We make a declaration. We decree and declare that we will rejoice and we will be glad in it, God. We thank you for this opportunity to come together and worship you. Oh, God, because it, it, the Bible says it's good for when we come together to worship you, God. So right now, that's what we want to do is we want to sing praises unto your name. We want to just come into your presence because in your presence is fullness of joy. And that's your right hand of pleasures forevermore. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. There's a little song I just want to sing right before Pastor gets up to speak. And it's, called, it's entitled, I Need You. So it's just a worship song. It's easy enough. You can pick up and sing along with me. I need you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. you more 
than anything more of you your lord more 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 of you 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 lord more of you 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 lord god i need you And nothing and nobody can satisfy This is what I do I lift my hands to my Father and I say I need you I need you I need you Oh, I need you I need you I need you Say I need you I need you Come on, say Say I need you I need you Yeah, I need you I need you Right in your living room, say, I need you, I need you. Say, I need you, I need you. Let us say, say, I love you, I love you. Tell them I love you, I love you. Daddy, I love you, I love you. Yes, I love you, I love you. Turn it to praise, say, I praise you, I praise you. Like you, I praise you, I praise you. Tell them I praise you, I praise you. You, I praise you. Tell them again. Say, I need you. I need you. Say, I need you. I need you. Yes, I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. One more time. One more time. Say, I need you. I need you. Gotta have you. Gotta have you. Tell them. Gotta have you. Gotta have you. Gotta have you. Gotta have you. Say, I in the name of Jesus we come to you right now with bowed heads and hearts wide open eyes closed but we're seeking God 
God, you are the sovereign God. You are the God of providence. That means, God, you're overall and you're intertwined and working things out even when we don't understand. We lean on that fact, God. We thank you for trusting hearts, God, that we know you're driving. Father, we know you control the hearts of kings. Outside of you, God, nothing functions. We ask right now, God, in the name of Jesus the Christ, God, that as we prepare our hearts and minds for the writ, give us understanding beyond our wisdom. Give us insight beyond our study. Help the preacher, God. Stretch me outside of a comfort zone, God, and don't be hindered by my finiteness. I thank you for the few that are assembled, God. And like the psalmist said, where you said if two or three were gathered, you'd be in the midst, God. We ask, oh God, that not only here, but those who are streaming from home, move, prepare. Come, Holy Ghost. We'll be ever so careful, God, to not be stingy with a thank you, not to be stingy with a lot of love you, with a hallelujah or an amen. And all is God's people. everyone breathing that you've touched we all say amen 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 okay so we are back again and this is we're back again with our with our uh, second ever historical sermon um, uh, service and it's been a, it's been a crazy week uh, we just got you know, we, we know a lot going on right now. We, we think that, that this upcoming week we're going to hear some, some, some new news. We don't know. But in the meantime, in between time, um, there, are, there, is, there is something I want to follow up on when I started last week. Last week I talked about the four, the four R's of time out. And this week I want to explore something from the prophet Jeremiah. So if you have Bibles, turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, um, verse 10. Je Jeremiah chapter 29, Verse 10, Jeremiah 29, 10. I want to get right into this this morning. And uh, I'm encouraging you, wherever you're, you're watching from, um, wherever you're watching from, have you a Bible in front of you. And, and if you got you an expensive TV, one of the smart TVs, you probably on YouTube and you watch it on the big screen or the little screen, wherever it may be. But um, I want you to have a Bible because after this is over, your homework is going to be to read the chapter preceding Jeremiah chapter 29. So if you got that, Jeremiah chapter 29, the 10th verse, go ahead and say it out loud. Say, word up. The text reads like this, Jeremiah chapter 29, the 10th verse. It says this, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. So what I want to talk about for a few this morning, I want to deal with prosper through your predicament. This, this verse is actually a parenthetical between two other verses. Th th this verse is God, it interrupts when God is telling Israel his plan. God is telling Israel, hey, here's, I have plans for you. And in my plan, I'm going to prosper you, I'm not going to harm you. And, and it's, it's, he's telling them what he's going to do. But it's, it, it comes at a, as a parenthetical. Because he starts out saying, it's going to be 70 years and I'm going to bless you. Not only am I going to bring you out, but I'm going to prosper you. And after I prosper you, you're going to pray to me. You're going to worship me. It's going to be all good. But he interrupts that with, the, I have plans for you to prosper and not harm you because he wants to know the reason why he's going to do it for him. He said, the reason why I got to bless you, the reason why I'm going to bring you out, the reason why you'll be better on the other side is because I haven't forgotten my plan. Now, even though Israel has not been the best followers, the best people, God is saying, but even you at your worst does not make me get amnesia of when it concerns to my plan, when it concerns to my plan for your life. It's interesting to know that God is telling Israel 
that in verse 20, in chapter 27, 28, Israel had actually gone away from God. God sent Jeremiah to say, Jeremiah, you got to go tell these people now because if they don't get it together, I'm going to remove myself from them. The Bible says Jeremiah preached and preached and preached and the people did not listen. So God says, so here's what I have to do. I have to take a break from the norm in order to get you where I want you to be. Now, he sends word through Jeremiah. Jeremiah writes a letter. Now, what's interesting is that Jeremiah, he writes this letter to his countrymen who were in captivity in Babylon under the thumb of Nebuchadnezzar. But Jeremiah himself, Joy Hill, Jeremiah himself was not in captivity. He was not in Babylon. Jeremiah was actually still in Jerusalem. He was in Jerusalem writing a letter of encouragement to those that were in captivity and tell them, hey, hang in there. God has a plan. Now, one may think, well, Jeremiah, that's easy for you to say because you're still in Jerusalem. You don't really understand what it's like to be in captivity. You're, you're, you're safe at home, but we're stuck in Babylon under a tyrant. Well, this is a good time and a lesson to tell you that in Jerusalem during this time, there was a famine going on. Jerusalem was not the place to prosper. God has turned his face, you ready, against Jerusalem. Jerusalem had become the, the for real hood. There was nothing growing in Jerusalem. It was, it was a wasteland at this time. There was nothing there. There were no markets, there were no gas stations. There was nothing in Jerusalem. It was a place that was barren. And here is what Jeremiah was writing from. Watch this now. Based on the text, Israel was in a better position to prosper while in exile under captivity than they were as they were free at home running around, says so, Roddy. Jere Jeremiah was writing to a people who even though they were in captivity, they were in a better position to prosper in captivity than they were when they were at home free to roam around. When they were at home, free, if they would have stayed in the situation, free to roam and not worship God. When they were free, they were not in a position to worship him. And so when they got into captivity, God, God is saying that you will be better off seeking me in bondage as opposed to ignoring me with your freedom. It's right through the text, and Jeremiah is writing this, this letter because he is saying, you need to take advantage of the benefits being offered through your bondage. Amen. Jeremiah is saying, Shelton, he's saying, take advantage of the benefits that are being offered to you through your bondage, huh? Preacher, how does that make sense? Well, let's, let's, let's take a logical, commonsensical approach to this statement. Would you agree that the best possible posture that we can ever be in is a posture that we're most attentive to God? Would you say that the best possible posture for we as God's people to be in is a posture when we're most attentive to God. Yes. Would you agree that the, the amenability towards God, that when we are amenable towards God, when we are pleasing towards God, when we're in a good position towards God, would you agree that that is, that is, that is oftentimes a precursor to God blessing us? When we get into right posture and position with God, isn't that usually the precursor to God blessing us? Well, if that's the case, then the antithesis of that statement is also true. When we're not in position, when we're not in a place where we're amenable towards God, that means that that's oftentimes the precursor to a curse. 
when we are not amenable towards God, that is usually the precursor for a curse. But when we are amenable towards God, that's usually the precursor for a blessing. So it does not matter what made us amenable. Whatever brought us to a place where we're listening to God, that thing positioned us to be blessed. Well, in the text this morning, I want to deal with what God told Israel via Jeremiah of actually how to prosper in the midst of a predicament. Now, people don't miss this now. God is saying, I'm going to show you how to prosper in your predicament. I'm not going to have to change anything. I'm not going to have to change who's in office. I mean, who's on the throne, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm not going to have to change where you are. I am going to show you how I can prosper you. People, I'm not talking about making ends meet. I'm not, I'm not talking about just making sure you got just enough. God says, I will show you how to prosper. This means if I'm going to prosper you, that means you're going to be better than you were before you went in. And the scripture gives us some steps. It gives us some rubrics to follow. Look in your Bibles with me in Jeremiah chapter 29, the fourth verse. It says this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel to all the exiles whom I sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Watch what God told them to do. He says, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. God is saying, you are captives. You're slaves. Go buy some real estate. Go, go build some homes. Then plant some gardens and eat from them. What God is saying that in the midst of your predicament, what I want you to do is to create ways to sustain yourselves. I need you to create ways to sustain yourself. Well, well how can I cross-pollinate that? How can I amalgamate that to a 2020 version? Well, how about this? Um, as you're in a predicament, what I need you to do to create some sustainability in your life, what I need for you to do is, watch this, I need you to sit down, since you now have time, I need you to do a budget. Amen. Create, you know what a budget is, I know it's, it's, it's not a, it's, a budget is B-U-D-G-E-T. A budget is something where you look at how much is going out and how much is coming in. You look at what you have as look at what you have as opposed to what you desire. A budget is a financial plan. A budget shows you what you have. And if you know what you have, you know what you cannot afford to spend. It's a budget. Now, now once you create a budget as you're sustaining yourself in this in your present predicament. Notice what it says about plant gardens. I like that text. I like that part of it. Because what God is saying about planting gardens and sustaining yourself, notice it says plant gardens with nests and not plant a garden. That means God is saying create ways of more than one income. Create more than one way to eat. Don't just plant corn because corn can be seasonal. Plant vegetables that grow in various seasons so you, so you never only have just one source to eat from. In this time of predicament, this is a great time to sit back and think of your plan of what can I do to sustain myself? Because some of us right now, some of you right now watching this, you've gotten laid off. And as a result of that, that garden is no longer available. But when God is saying, I need you to create gardens, that means you have more than one in industry to scale from. Second, in verse six, it says, 
take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Now, this is a little deeper. So now it's moved passing, it's moved past find a way to kind of to, 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 to scale and to sustain myself. Now he's saying, join with what I'm, with, with what I'm um, hermeneutically interpreting as the culture. It's saying, engage the culture of where you are. Don't become the culture, but you must, must not be afraid to engage the culture and learn from it. Biblical examples might be Moses, it might be Joseph, and even Esther. They all three had one thing in common. They all had to learn the culture of where they were to engage it for the advancement of God's agenda. Moses had to learn the ways of Egypt. Joseph had to learn the ways of Egypt. Esther had to learn the way of Persia. She had to learn how to approach the king. But as they engaged culture, God had a plan of how to use a culture that they engaged for his plan. The problem is we feel that the call to ministry is, 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 is only restricted to a pulpit. We feel that God's call to ministry, it doesn't go past the pulpit. And God's platform, his platform has to move beyond the church address. Some people aren't coming to church. Certain people aren't even Christian. But God may have given you a global business plan that your business may take you across the waters to engage those who know nothing about Christ, but as a result of your business. I wonder, I wonder how, how can God, what can God do? What can God do to get us to take the church home? If only God would come up with a way that what we do at church we do at home if only God could get us to open Bibles at home if if only God could think of a way that we say I need you at home I wonder what could God I don't know where you may be streaming from but but here in Texas here in Texas um, um, the schools have Clothes and, and our and our children are are, do, are are getting their studies online. So 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 right now, parents are working with kids at home, and when it pertains to their homework. Um, in, in, in other words, um, the school is now at home. The school is now at home. There used to be a time where that was not unusual. It used to be a time where, 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 where most kids were schooled at home. It appears that the school has returned home. I wonder, has prayer returned to the school, if the school has returned home, where coincidentally the church is too. I'm just when we step back and look at this thing, we complain that well they took prayer out of school, but now school has come home. I wonder, has prayer yet to return to school? Even though the school is in your home where coincidentally the church is, and it's a sad thing when there's no prayer going on in church either. If you are praying at church, and now school is at home and home at church. And then by default, guess what? Church or prayer has returned.
to school. There's been a prayer for so many. If we can just get church, if we can just get home, if we can just get prayer back into school, God's okay. I'll start with the church at home and then I'll get to school at home and then I'll get prayer at your house. I wonder if we're helping our kids do their work, but we didn't start the morning with prayer. Since it's at your school, it just makes sense. You can teach or have them read the Ten Commandments like they used to back in the day. If they're at, if they're at your, because you're now the superintendent of your school. You can implement certain things at your school. You can give extracurricular. They can't play basketball now. They can't go to all these other practices, that soccer practice, and drama, cheerleader, um, golf, and, and all this stuff, these extracurricular activities that you ran around to take them when you cannot go anywhere. I wonder if one extracurricular activity you'll give them this time is just to learn the books of the Bible. What's the <laughs> Okay, um, I'm positive you're shouting at home. Um, verse 7 says something. Verse 7, and okay, now, I need you at this point to open your minds. I promise you I am not being intentionally, spiritually petty, right? But the text is saying something, and when I saw this, it, hmm, I, you know, sometimes when I'm in the text, I have to get up and kind of walk certain things off. When I saw this one, I had to walk around. The text says in verse 7, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Point number one. God did it. God sent them into exile. Nebuchadnezzar did not take them. God sent them and used Nebuchadnezzar for the ride. The text says, seek the welfare of a place I've sent you that you were, that by all intents and purposes, you were afraid to go. Can you imagine on their way to Babylon, all the trepidations and fears and thoughts and nervousness on their way to a land they've never, been, they've never been before? He says, seek the welfare of this foreign place where I've sent you and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare? It's, it says, I need you to pray for the place you don't want to be. Pray that it's blessed. He says, because in praying that it is blessed, you will be blessed. Okay? In other words, the text is saying, I need you to pray for where you've, you've been planted. I need you to pray for where you've been planted. Here's the problem. The problem may be your city of, your city of exile, your Babylon, the place you don't want to be where God has sent you, It may be a husband or wife. <laughs> what if God is calling you to pray for a husband and wife or a wife that you really don't want to be with? What if God is causing, calling you to pray when you think about it, you say, God, I shouldn't have did it. I shouldn't have been here. I did not seek your face on this. This is now if you're streaming with that person, just look straight ahead. Don't look. <laughs> but what if God is saying you're too busy trying to get out of it? You're, you're too busy looking for a, a way of escape. <laughs> I need you to pray for the one 
that you don't want to be with. Pray that God bless them. Because if you pray for their well-being, you're actually praying for your, it's a boomerang effect. I need you, I need you, watch this now. I know you hate your job. But you need to pray for that company. Pray for, now I know you're getting your resume ready, you're trying to find, the, you're going to get them the first opening, but I need you, if God has planted you with that company, I need you to pray unceasingly for the success and welfare of that particular business because that's where you've been planted and pray for the church that hurt you. It's amazing how you're, watch this now, and my question to you is, if the church has hurt you that much, why you ain't gone? Why are you still there? Now, I'm going to presuppose that you're not there to be, you know, petty. What if you say, well, God has not released me? Okay, okay, he didn't release you. But are you praying for the success of the church while you're there? Are you praying that God prosper the church? Or are you just waiting to tell everybody I told you so? If you've been planted there, you must pray for his well-being. Not just sit in the corner and criticize everything that's done. Are you praying for the place you've been planted? Now, if you would, and if you can't say man here, just kind of wiggle your toes, but you got to also pray for the parent that birthed you but didn't back you. Pray for the parent that birthed you but never nurtured you. This could be tough. Because the parent that gave birth to you never backed you. The one that birthed you never really took time to nurture you. And I'm saying even that parent is one you got to pray for. See, it's hard to hold a grudge against what you're praying for. See, if I'm praying for your success, if I'm praying that you be, it's hard for me to hold a grudge against who I'm praying for. I tell anybody, the litmus test of whether or not you've forgiven a person is can you pray that God bless them? If you can't pray that God bless them, you have not forgiven them. If, it, if, it, if something bugs you every time you even think about them doing well, you've not forgiven them. You are not free from that bitterness. You're not, you're not, you're not free from them until you can see them blessed. But, but what about what they did? It's not on you. Vengeance is mine. Said our job, we're not the judge. One reason why we can't judge Sheldon is because we don't know all the details. We only know our perspective. We don't know what else was involved and why they weren't even there. And I know it's tough because we've been hanging on, hanging on to a, a presupposition for a long time. But last week I told you that folly is bound up in the heart of a child. You're holding on possibly to a childhood hurt. You're hurt from a child's perspective. You're hurt from a child's paradigm. You couldn't even see the full picture. All you know is you asked for it and you did not get it on Christmas. That's all you know is that here's what I told her I want. I told her I wanted this Christmas. That's all you see is what you did not get for Christmas. And ever since a child, from a child's perspective, you've been hanging on to what if they, they didn't give me what I cried for. I was a good child. I did this. I did that. I made good grades. And they couldn't get me one bike for Christmas. And my daddy said he was going to get it. And he didn't do it. He's a liar. My daddy, he said he was going to get the bike. He never got the bike. 
from a child's perspective. That's a big deal because he didn't get you a bike that he said he'd get, right? But as an adult, from an adult lens, you will look at that same situation and though you did not get the bike that morning, you would think about the dinner on the table that afternoon. What if he only had enough to buy the food? What if he only had enough to pay half of the electric bill that was two months due? What if he only had enough to keep the lights on and put food on the table? What if he only had enough? But you've been hanging on to a childhood hurt, only looking at it through that lens when there were other factors. And, and, and he said to Jeremiah, he's like, just, just, just pray Whew. for where you were planted. Um, there is some, there's a warning here. There's a warning here for those who are quick to say what God said. I, I, I've been hearing a lot of people, you know, stand up and say, well, God says this and God is saying uh, this is about to come to pass, that this will be over in three days, this will be over. This will be. I've been hearing a lot of that. And it's intriguing to me because the Bible addresses, there were those during this time of exile they were doing the same thing. Look in your Bibles at uh, chapter, uh, chapter 29, verse 8. It says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Now, I, I don't know who your pastor is. I don't know who your bishop your, I, I don't know. But I am saying that during this time, there were some prophets, there's some preachers, and some pontiffs saying, it'll be over soon. One by the name of Hananiah, if you read back in, in chapter 28, the latter part of 28, one prophet by the name of Hananiah, he said, this will all be over soon. He went so far, Jeremiah, God had told Jeremiah to get a yoke and put around, his, put around his neck to symbolize the yoke of Israel. You know what Hananiah did? Hananiah snatched the yoke off of Jeremiah's neck and broke it. He said, God, and that's how God is going to break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar and bring his people out. Well, he was a preaching fool, Hananiah was. He, Hananiah was somebody's preacher. And the people were believing Hananiah. We're about to come out. In a day now, the only problem, as Jeremiah told Hananiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah told Hananiah, I wish you were right. I'm, Hananiah, I wish, I wish you were right. The only problem, God didn't say that. And as a result, Hananiah, you're going to die this year. Hananiah died a few months later. I'm just telling some of my Fiery breathing preachers, be careful when you stand up about what God said. God said this. Be careful when you mislead God's people, some God said. Because, matter of fact, the text clearly says God said it's going to be what? 70 years. My point is, people, I don't know how long we're going to be here. It might be a while. But in the meantime, Sustain yourself. You got to find, you got, you got no need, you got to sustain yourself. Don't be afraid to engage a culture that God has, engaged, that God has exposed us to. And you got to pray for where you've been planted and where are you planted right now? In your house, pray for your home. Look around the house, discover what needs prayer. Don't resent what you see, pray for it. You may discover you may discover some stuff in your house. 
that you are not pleased with that you never even noticed before because you weren't there long enough to look. You may see some stuff in your house. Now, our launch text of God knows the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not, 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 not harm you. The, there's good and bad news there. I give you the good news because that's how I want to present it. God has a plan. God had a plan the whole time. God's desire was to bring them out and make them prosperous in the process. He was not going to wait until they're out to bless them, but he, his plan was to make them prosperous in the meantime. Watch this now. And God's plan could not be stopped. That's good news. The bad news is that it wasn't going to happen for a while. It was going to be about, it's going to be 70 years. Now, 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 I have no idea how long our 70 years will last because your 70 is symbolic of complete. So God will, God let them be in captivity for as long as they needed to be in captivity to bring his plan into fruition. So I don't know how long we must be on what we're on, but our seven years, our seven years may be a week, maybe 72 hours. But what if it's 10 years? What, what, what if it's going to be a while? What I'm saying is that don't be like Israel sitting around idle thinking this is going to be over next week. What I'm saying is there's some things to start doing right now in the midst of the predicament that you should not wait. It's, we cannot wait until a thing is over before we seek to prosper from it. This plan that God has, again, God took ownership of having sent them into captivity. It was not Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was simply a tool that God used. Okay, so I mentioned Moses earlier. I mentioned Moses earlier. Let me see I can do this. I mentioned Moses earlier. Moses earlier, how Moses was not afraid to engage um, how Moses engaged the Egyptian culture, but he used it. He was, he was trained in Egyptian culture. He, was, he, he had to leave town abruptly because he killed a man. He went from the palace to wandering the desert. He was exiled in a sense of wandering around. And, and, now, and, that, and instead of Moses forgetting who he was, he ran across Jethro's daughter who was being harassed by a group of individuals. The Bible says that Moses ran them off. Um, Jethro's daughter ran home and said, Daddy, the dude rolled up and they was about to take the sheep and he defended us. Moses ends up marrying Jethro's daughter. After he marries Jethro's daughter, Moses then is put over taking care of Jethro's sheep. For 40 years, he watched over sheep. For 40 years, he took care of sheep. Interesting enough, the word pastor comes from the same word of shepherding and pastoring, pastoring a flock. So for 40 years, he had to pastor sheep. He probably had no idea. That even though he had been trained in Egyptian policy, Egyptian architect, Egyptian strategy, he had learned all these things, but we had never learned quite how to do and how to pastor people. And who would have thunk that the first 40 years of pastoring sheep was in preparation for pastoring people. Who, what has, what might God has said, okay, you learned all that other stuff. You are a good manager at your job. You learn, you, 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 you're, you're a great soldier. You, you, you learn your craft. You learn all that well. But the one thing that you don't do well is pastor your house. You're doing all this, and if you want me to promote you to love on 
and care for people you don't know. I got to teach how to fall in love and care for the ones that you do know. Preach it when with God, but when he going to speak? When, when is God going to change it around? People, I don't know. But in Genesis 1, in Genesis 1, I see a pattern with God. I see a pattern. In Genesis 1, it says, it says, it says that in the beginning, the earth was without form. It was, it was, it was, it was void without form. It said that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit hovered. It moved over nothing. It hovered. It moved over the deep. It moved. And, and as it moved, the Bible says God spoke. When the Holy Spirit moved, when it hovered, then God spoke. God did not speak until the Holy Spirit moved. Amen. Our prayer needs to be move Holy Spirit and speak law and speak clear. The only way this thing turns around is, 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 is it's not going to change until he moves. Because when he moves, that's when he speaks. Even right now, those that are listening, wherever you see pestilence, wherever you see pandemic, wherever you see confusion, wherever you see chaos, the prayer should be, oh, move Holy Spirit. Move where? Right where I am. Move in the room. Holy Spirit, move over those I'm responsible for. Holy Spirit, move over my children. Holy Spirit, move over a situation that I'm not crazy about, but Lord, since you planted me here, move over it, God. If it's connected to me, move. And God, as you're moving all these things, God, move over my mind, spirit. Move over my heart. And when you move, I need you then speak. I need you. When you move, God, when your spirit hovers, will you speak, Lord? And when you speak, God, help me hear. And God, if I, I must admit, Now that I'm sitting here listening to this word at home, I don't have the distractions I've realized I had at church. Sometimes, sometimes, the bigger the crowd, the bigger the devil. Sometimes, the bigger the crowd, the bigger the distraction. But Lord, I'm asking you right now, right where I am. Move, Holy Spirit. Now that I'm still, I'm not worried about my parking space. I'm not worried about being the crowd. I'm not worried. Now that I'm still, my feet don't hurt. I'm not hungry. Now that I'm, I'm still. Move, Holy Spirit. Prosper me in this predicament, God. Give me a plan of how to sustain. I'm listening, Lord. I'm listening. Give me the plan. Help me not forget the four R's I learned last week. I want to come out of this thing better than I was when I came into it. And one word from you, Lord, just one word. If you're able to calm the wind, you can calm the situation, God. Speak, Lord, and change it for my good. 
In Jesus' name, Lord, I ask it. Amen. This is God's word for God's people. Hear it and be saved. Be saved. Amen. We, now's the time. If you heard the word and, and you're seeing how there's some things to do while we're in this predicament. And maybe you're saying, you know what? I already have a good plan of sustainability when it comes to my budget, but I don't have the plan to, to sustain my soul. I'm not saved. I, 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 if I be honest, I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I thought about it at church, maybe too many people. I want to walk down or forever. Listen, if you heard this word today, he said, preacher, as I look at myself, as I think about my sustaining plan, I'm not saved. I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If that's you this morning and you want to accept the Lord, you can do that right now from your home. Now, Joy, you can be ready for me. If, 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 um, if that's you this morning, you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can do that right where you are. Now, baptism, the world does not save anyone. Baptism is the first step of obedience for a believer. But what saves you according to Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your heart and believe it, confess, confess your mouth and believe in your heart, Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead. If you can believe that, that's what saves you. Your next step is baptism. You can be saved right now and we'll baptize you when you come back to church. Maybe you say, a preacher, I'm saved. I love the Lord. I've been baptized. But what I am in need of is a good church home. And who would have thought that listening to something virtually I can realize that I, I, I will come to realization that I want to be a part of a church if that's true we'd love to have you here there's going to be some information following this, this sermon or maybe on the screen right now that you can call we have, a, we have people waiting to hear from you even right now to accept Christ to be a part of our church that's you you can do it right now we're going to take um, Joy do you have a song something like that? okay we're going we're gonna to get ready to close just a second with, with a song from Joy Hill. I guess, Psalms, thank you so much, Joy, for what you did today. Just one second. Um, but before we close out with our song, we do want to have a giving opportunity to worship through our giving. Um, so the, the test give option is on the screen. You know what to do right there. Um, we invite you to, to, to join with us in our kingdom building through your gifts. Uh, if you have your gifts ready right now, I can even pray for offering um, before we close in song as you're getting your hearts prepared to give, not your head, but your heart. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift and the giver. We pray, oh God, that every dime is used for the building of your kingdom, oh God. We just ask God that you, ultimately God, that we are to take responsibility and be good stewards, but at the end of the day, God, if you don't breathe on our finances, it'll all be for naught anyway. So breathe on our obedience, God as we sow our seed into kingdom significant things. God, I pray in Jesus' name, God, to return to them tenfold what they sow. You said, God, that you would give seed to the sower. If we sow bountifully, God, you return bountifully, oh God. You said in your word, God. And I ask, God, you send a special covering and special dispensation of grace and mercy and, and bountiful harvest to those that obey this morning. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Joy Hill. Hands together at home for Joy Hill. Pray us out. Sing us out. We need a word from the Lord. A word from the Lord. Oh, just one word from the Lord that will remove all doubts and cause the sun to shine and give us peace of mine speak Lord speak Lord we need a word from the Lord a word from the Lord just one word from the Lord that will remove all doubts and cause the sun to shine Speak, Lord.
God bless you all our streaming audience. We will either we'll see you virtually next week or back in church. But God bless your life. Go back, read your notes, read your Bible. Take full advantage of this time that God has given us to be at home. God bless you. See you next week.